Okay, while I'm setting up for this next project, let me fill you in on the background. It all started with a few questions in an email from a soldier about the best way to fit glass into an arch. In later discussions, I found out that he was making it for his best friend who had taken his life. I volunteered to make the shadow box and was honored that he agreed and humbled that he thought my work was good enough. So this box is being created in memory of William Victor Block of the 4th ID, 3rd Brigade, Recon Troop, 9th Cavalry. To start, my only limitations on this box were measurements of 21 by 24 inches. Starting with a 10 inch wide piece of oak, I measure out 24 inches, squared my saw, and made two cuts. This gives me the height and a little extra on the width, up to 20 inches. Laying my boards side by side, I measure out 21 inches, then I take it to the table saw and cut them. Now the highlight of the box is going to be the knife, so I just need to make sure that these measurements will accommodate the knife. We will now begin drawing out the top arch. At the top, measure in 8 inches from both sides towards the center. This will give you 5 inches in between both marks. Measure down to 8 inches and 8 inches across to get your pivot point. Then take a scrap piece of wood, place two small marks 8 inches apart, and drill holes. Put a nail in one hole and tack it into the pivot point. Then place a pencil in the other hole and mark out your arch. Then repeat this step to the other side. Remember, this board is a little less wide so your pivot point should look a little different. The outer edge of the arch is now complete. Now we need to draw the inner edge. Place a mark an inch and a half from one of your previous holes and drill it out. Now using the same process as before, and the same pivot points mark the inside of the arch. Now starting on the box itself, I try to conserve wood by making it just long enough to extend fully past the arch. I cut it on the miter saw and then make my inch and a half cuts on the table saw. The box will need to be three layers high, so excluding the base piece, I need to cut four pieces, two for each side. I need two more pieces that will fully cover the remaining portion of the arch. Laying one side in place, I take a side and draw out my cut line. Then I take it to the miter saw and cut the piece to fit. I do this twice so I have the arch three pieces high just like the sides. The next step is to glue your sides into position. As always, grab all your clamps. If you don't have that many, you can do this step one side at a time. I apply my wood glue and then use the workbench as a flat edge and place the boards on their side. Then I begin to apply my clamps. This will make sure I keep the boards flush with one another as I apply my clamps down. Okay, very important here. When applying the second side, don't apply your sides to the side of the base with the pencil marks. Use the naked back side. You will understand why later. Once they are dry, remove your clamps. So the reason we applied one of the sides to the back side was so that we could have a stagger across the arch. In my head, I thought that this would give more stability. Not sure if it really mattered, but you know how I love overkill. Take your pieces over to the table saw. At this point, we are going to cut the inside of the box. Raise your table saw blade over all three pieces. Don't forget to make your stop mark. This will keep you from cutting too deep into your arch. Then. When you're done that, take a jigsaw and cut away the excess to make your pieces lighter and more manageable. Once you have both sides cut, you can go back to your arch and apply the wood glue, and with your center pieces, place them back together and allow them to dry. If you have a clamp large enough, use it to squeeze your pieces together to ensure a good bond between the sides and the arch exists. Repeat this process to both sides and allow them to dry. Once they dry, go back to your scrap piece and draw out your arch on the side where it is not showing. This next step can be completed with a jigsaw, but you will need a 7 inch blade. If you have a bandsaw, this makes the process a lot easier. Simply cut out the rest of your arch. Either way, they both get the job done. Now we are going to start working on the face plate of the spur. First, switch over to mahogany wood. 
We change up the wood so that we can get a great contrast between the spur and the rest of the box. Cut your sides ensuring you have enough overlap and then cut a few smaller pieces to cover the arch. Ensure one of your smaller pieces is at least 8 inches. We will cut the widths to fit after we see how the arch fits on them. Lay out your pieces on a flat surface and place the arch on top of them. If you have a clamp big enough, squeeze your faceplate together to prevent any movement while you outline your arch. So I don't lose orientation, I take a sharpie and label each piece 1 through 5. This is really not needed, but I have been known to mix up my pieces. Make sure your center piece is aligned perfectly in the center. Adjust all other pieces from the center out. Here I place a scrap piece of wood on the box and clamp it down. This is just to prevent any movement once I start outlining the spur on the faceplate. The next step is to trace out the box on the faceplate and then again using a spacer of a half inch diameter. If you want to see how I made this spacer, check out the Texas Shadow Box link here. Once you have it all traced out, go back and write lip on the inside lip to distinguish between the lip and the box. Now we are going to join the face plate together. At each joint, choose one side and place an X. The side you choose is not important. Pull out your pocket jig and in the center of the main lines, not in the lip, draw your pocket holes. Draw your pocket holes on the faces without the X. Continue this process until all pieces of the face plate can be joined together. Take your pieces back to a flat surface and realign. Very important here. Before you do anything, erase the outer lip of your center piece. Then choose two of the pieces to join together and begin cutting on both sides. Cut both lips. Repeat this process to the other side. When it comes to the center piece, only cut the inside lip. Your outside lip should have been erased. Grab the two outer scrap pieces that you just cut away. We will use them to build the spur shank. Align your center piece with the inside lip, then make a small mark at the ends of the outer lip. Cut the scrap pieces down to a manageable size and place on the center face piece. With a ruler, evenly space your pieces. We will use these to draw out the template for the shape of the shank. Once you have the basic shape drawn out, grab a protractor or anything round to smooth out your edges. This was the reason we placed the small mark on the outside of the center face piece. Then I took a sharpie to make my lines more visible so I could get a good feel if I thought this was going to work or not. Next I took it to the bandsaw and cut out the outside perimeter. Hold off on cutting too far into the center until we have the inside curve drilled out. Find a hole saw that matches the circumference of the bend and press it out. Okay, I know mahogany is hard, but I think I earned a Boy Scout merit badge here for making a fire without matches. Once you have your center pressed out, then you can cut the rest of the shank. Now you can put it back in place to see how you are progressing. Take the scrap pieces and cut them a little bit higher than the bottom of the box. At this point, we are going to sand the base of the box while it is still accessible. Take your time and use the three-stage sanding that I always use. By starting with 60, then use 100, and then use 220 grit sandpaper. When you're finished, the box should be really smooth. Before continuing, I need to make sure that my end pieces of the base are exactly the same length. Place the box on its 5-inch flat surface, and with a square, measure to see the difference. Whatever the difference, cut them to match. I got really lucky here, as mine were not even a fraction off. Okay, this next step is complete overkill and not needed at all, but for fun, I thought I would cut a groove in the side of the box for the bottom piece. This in my head would make it fit like a tongue and groove board. I do not recommend this. I recommend that you simply cut your piece to the exact width to save yourself an extra 30 minutes of work. There is really no difference in the outcome of the final product. So what I did was make my marks and then with a router I cut the grooves out freehanded, about a half an inch deep. I did this on both sides of the inner box and then I would check with a piece of scrap piece and if it was too tight I would use a little sandpaper to thin it up. 
Once my piece was snug, I moved on. Now that I had my grooves cut, I measured from groove to groove and cut the piece for the bottom of the base box. After the length is cut, take your piece to the table saw and a half inch down and a quarter inch deep cut your glass groove. Then place it back in the box, align your glass groove flush with the top of the base and mark your bottom. Then cut your bottom mark on the table saw. Although we did not really need the grooves on the inside of the box as shown earlier, you will need them here on the bottom side of the faceplate. This is so your glass extends below the base piece and not just butt it up against it. Align your base piece on your faceplate. Your line should still be present. I clamp mine down so it doesn't move. Then I trace out the groove. With a small square, I make my line straight. I erase all other confusing lines. Now the next step is overkill again. As long as you stay in your lines to keep the faceplate snug, you should have no problems. Nothing in this step will be visible when the box is finished. I drill out my corners so after I route the groove, the corners will be a little bit tighter. Go back to your cross piece and measure your glass groove up to the top of the edge. It should be a half an inch if I remember correctly. Whatever the measurement is, set your router to that depth. Check your fit with a scrap piece and if snug, move on. Repeat this to both sides. If all goes well, you can grab a scrap piece of plexiglass and place it on the lip and in the glass groove. Your cross piece should remain flush. Take your face plate back apart and apply your wood glue. Then screw it back together. Now we are going to cut out the plexiglass. Place the plexiglass under the base of the box and with a sharpie trace out the inside of the box. Do not draw out the bottom of the box. This will need to extend a quarter of an inch so it extends inside your glass groove. The rest of the plexiglass will sit on the face lip. Using your table saw, you can now cut your straightaways. After that is complete, you can either use a jigsaw or bandsaw to cut your arch. Using your back plate as a guide for the depth, we are now going to cut out the back plate relief. Use your router freehand, or if you have a router table, route it there. This should be easy since there are not many swerves. To see this in detail, check out the Texas shadow box here. A simple way to cut your back plate to fit is to use the plexiglass. Lay your plexiglass on the back plate and with a ruler, add a quarter of an inch or the width of your route cut. Make your marks and connect your lines. Then, using the same process you used to cut out the plexiglass, cut out your back plate. Since your router bit does not cut corners and tends to leave them rounded, it's easier just to cut off the corners of your back plate to make it fit. With the back plate in place, trace out the inside perimeter of the box. You will use this later. Now we are going to build the housing for the ensign. Place a mark 7 inches up from the base. Then find the center of the box and cross your first mark. From here we will build our triangle. Starting at the corner of your perimeter line, connect the corner to the cross mark in the center. Do this on both sides. Since the box interior will define our triangle, I will forego the math and just lay out pieces and mark and cut them. I continue this process for both top pieces of the triangle. You don't need to cut a base piece since the bottom of the box will be the base of the triangle. Again, overkill here. You can simply glue and tack your two pieces together, but here I decide that I want to use my dowling jig. I'm not really sure why. Since the angle was so small, I actually only used one dowel by cutting it in half. This would make it fit better. Here's a neat trick. If you don't actually have a doweling jig, you can use your drill press as long as you put a collar on the bit. Make sure everything with the ends and housing looks good, and then take it out and start your sanding process. Since we are already set up for sanding, Grab your face plate and sand to the same standards. To ensure our flag stays completely flat and the stars are aligned, I trace out the triangle on some scrap plexiglass. Now it's time to attach our face plate. Have your clamps at the ready. You will need as many as you can get for this next step. 
Place a bead of glue on the top of the base frame and spread out evenly with your finger. Then lay your faceplate onto the box. Clamp down securely, flip over, and remove any excess glue that has squeezed out. Once dry, remove your clamps. Our next step is going to be filling out the shank. With the pieces you cut earlier, cut two more pieces about the same size. We are going to glue them together to give the shank more definition. Remember, this is all leftover scrap wood from your earlier cuts. Apply your wood glue, thin it out evenly, make sure all of the wood is covered, and then glue and clamp down. Do this to both sides. Okay, I edit out the first rendition of the heel band because it was pointed out to me on Facebook that my heel band grooves were going in the wrong direction. Okay, so here is the process for making them. Let's remake these now. Start with a piece of mahogany that is at least 8 inches long. With a level and the box on a flat surface, mark from the face plate across your board. Do this from both the top and the bottom of the spur face plate. Then slide up to the bottom of the crossbar and mark the bottom of the box. Earlier, I used a quarter and traced out four circles. Then I joined the circles with a ruler. Since I have already done this once, I will just use the previous ones as a template. From there, I just used the protractor and straightened up my lines where needed and made the others rounded and smooth. I erased all other lines at that point that were not needed. To cut the end of the strap, I used a miter saw. For all other straight cuts, I used the fence on my band saw. When making the cut that will butt up against the back of the box, make it just a tad bit shorter than your line. You can adjust this after you see how it slides in and see how the fit sets. Find a hole saw that fits perfectly between your two cut lines and cut out your groove. Do not extend past the back line. Then, with a jigsaw or bandsaw, cut out the remaining corners. While you still have your hole saw set up, press out your strap eyelet corners. Since I was making both sides at the same time, I continued to cut out all eight holes. With a fine wood cut jigsaw blade, connect your holes by cutting straight across on each side. Now you can go back and finish cutting out the rest of the shape. The reason we waited was because we needed the extra length for something to clamp down on while we were cutting and drilling. Cut all remaining straightaways on the miter saw. Switch back to your band saw and round off all your corners. Check both sides to ensure both pieces are snug and you don't need to adjust anything. Then grab a detail sander and make sure you smooth out all sharp edges. With the strap in place, trace out your sides. Then with a protractor, make an even mark an inch away from the tip of the strap and then round them out. With a jigsaw or bandsaw, cut out your marks. Now let's go back to your shank. Your pieces should be good and dry. Place each piece in its position and trace out from the face plate. From here, shape out the rest of the shank with a square and a protractor. Here's where you can apply your artistic license. Whatever shape you really want it to be is what you can make it. When cutting out your shank, you will need a bandsaw. I don't think you can get away with using a jigsaw here. Use your fence for the straightaways and cut the rest by eyeing it. With your cut piece in place, make a mark flush with the back of the box and then take it to the miter saw and cut it. Once you have finished cutting both out, you can do a light sand, but don't sand too much, we'll sand them later. Before we attach them, we need to drill out the hole for the spur. Take a couple of clamps to hold them in position, and then flip your box upside down. With a protractor, get a feel for where your pivot point needs to be. Then mark one of your shank pieces and take to the drill press and drill out. Make sure your drill bit is at the same circumference as your dowel. Now match up the drilled one to the other side and with a pencil trace out the circle. Now that we have those drilled, let's attach them. First, take the two pieces and place the dowel through them. This will make sure they're aligned once you glue them down. Then take out your wood glue, place in position and clamp down. 
With a scrap piece across the top, I will clamp them both down evenly to make sure that they are flush with the rest of the box. The good news is that we know that the spur is the same size as the protractor. The bad news is I have no idea if I can cut a perfect circle with a bandsaw. So this first attempt is just a test with some scrap wood. Okay, pulling this off just boosted my confidence, so I jump right into the real thing. Now you can make your spur any size, shape, or design that you want to, but I'm going to make mine look like a paddle wheel. I draw out my design right on the wood using round objects lying around the garage. If you're wondering what that thing in the middle was, it was a magnetic screw dish. The second object is my diameter plug that I cut from the plexiglass to use on the lip of the box. After your design is drawn out, you can begin cutting it out. After I used my hole saw to cut out the crescents, I began cutting out the outer edge of the circle. This was much easier than one complete continuous circle like in my test. At this point, your shank should be dry, so we are going to sand it down into shape. Sand all pieces flush with the bottom faceplate and round all edges evenly. Use a sanding block to get the hard to reach places. For the hard to reach places on the bootstrap, I used a sanding wheel on my Dremel. Once sanded, glue your bootstraps into place. Once your glue is dry, then you can sand down all your cut edges so they're nice and smooth with the bottom of the bootstrap. Before we begin to stain, hit the entire box with 220 grit sandpaper. When it comes to staining, I want the spur and the box to look like two separate pieces. For the box, I will stain in a light classic oak. For the spur, I will stain in a dark Bombay. As in all my stain jobs, I just use paper towels and rub it on evenly. If you're worried about spillage or a little bit of bleed over, painter's tape works great to separate the two colors. Grab your plexiglass and trace out the shape directly on your foam board, then cut it out. Place it inside your box and grab your ensign triangle. Place into position and trace out directly onto the display board. Normally, I cut my display board an eighth of an inch smaller, but for this box, skip that step because we will be cutting the display board in half and that will negate the need for an eighth inch gap. Find the center of your display board and then make a mark. From that mark, draw a line from it to the top of the triangle. Using some scrap plexiglass, place the pieces in the glass groove at the base of the box. We are now going to attach the ends and display. If you're using real glass, you need to install the glass before this step. Due to the mounting of the large knife, the next step in this video is a video in itself. If you're interested in how I mounted the knife and applied the felt for this box, click here. This is where I make the box shine. Here I'm going to try some triple thick polyurethane to see how it does. I bought the sandable kind. Here I will apply it with a brush. Before you install your plexiglass, pull off the plastic protection on the back side and pull back at least two inches on the front side. This step is easier if you have someone help you. Simply bend the plexiglass and slide into position. Take a small drill bit and drill three pilot holes into the plexiglass to fasten it to the lip of the faceplate. Just enough so the screws don't crack the plexiglass. Don't drill through your faceplate. Then screw in your screws. Grab the triangle you cut earlier for the flag. Align your stars perfectly and fold the triangle into the flag. Then place in the box. I tape mine up so it doesn't get in the way. Now take your dowel and spur and place into position. With a hammer, gently tap it into position. Now take the top of your box and place it onto the display board. Flip it over and drill some pilot holes and then screw your back plate with the display board into the box. This should be the final step. So from concept to creation, that's how you can do it right out of your own garage. If you're interested in to see how I made this stand, click below.